if a plane is flying and uh, uh, somebody starts removing the rivets from the wing, at a certain point the wing will fall off and the plane will crash. And if each rivet is a species, and we are managing the environment by losing species one at a time, it might be at some point that that ecosystem collapses. The influences that we've had as a species uh, incurs, you know, all kinds of influences on these other environments. And it's really uh, not a case that we can stand back and say, well, let nature run its course, because nature is already being strongly influenced by human activity. So we really do need to understand those influences. Dr. Stephen Franklin is the former Vice President of Research at the University of Saskatchewan. Currently, he is the President of Trent University, a school renowned for environmental science and interdisciplinary studies. Dr. Franklin is an author, a teacher, and an expert in the science of remote sensing. For me, remote sensing, I define it very simply as the, you know, detection, recognition, and analysis or evaluation of, of uh, surfaces and objects from a distance. And the technology we use is based on sensors that are uh, carried on platforms like airborne platforms, uh, airplanes, helicopters, uh, balloons, a number of different types of airborne devices, and uh, instruments on satellites. Remote sensing is currently this very large sort of imaging science uh, perspective that uh, had its origins in aerial photography and has its uh, technological advancement in the use of, of new kinds of sensing devices, radars and, and lidars, light detection and ranging or laser sensing. The whole technology has really become a much more uh, powerful uh, way of viewing environmental phenomena and I think it's uh, probably going to get even easier uh, as more and more images and more and more people demand to see the environment from this particular perspective. So it's more difficult for example now I think for people to engage in tremendous alteration of the environment uh, without a lot of other people being aware of it and being able to ask some questions about whether that's the right way to proceed. I feel very fortunate that I've been able to combine a kind of a academic position with, uh, you know, my obvious love of nature and my ability to spend as much time as possible in the environment. I'm the kind of field scientist that it would be very difficult to be, to be uh, satisfied that I've had the good year that I'd like to have each year, good productive year, scholarly work as well as administratively. Uh, if I don't have at least some time that I can spend in the natural environment. My parents were, uh, were immigrants and when they arrived in Toronto they, you know, really had a young family. They wanted to kind of get to know Canada a little bit and so we did spend a lot of time camping when we were, you know, when I was young and it was during those early kinds of exposures to uh, uh, to Algonquin Park, for example, and, uh, and uh, I just found myself very attracted. I wanted to spend more time in those environments. I mean, it's often the case that uh, what you're trying to do when you're developing your career is to think about how to best spend time doing the things you love to do, but also to contribute to, in this case, to the increasing knowledge that's required in order to support environmental management. I studied forestry at, uh, at Lakehead University, and. And uh, at Lakehead, there was, again, a very strong field component that was necessary for all the students to participate in, and it was just something I really enjoyed. And so, uh, certainly as a student, I was very fortunate to, uh, to have uh, the opportunity to spend time in many natural environments. Uh, I worked for the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources for a couple of summers, for example, and, and then I went to, uh, uh, to the Yukon, worked in a couple of national parks. Uh, and it was that uh, ability I had to kind of meld the academic work that I'd been doing 
uh, with remote sensing images, interpreting those images over the course of the winter, for example, and then using the summer to go back and check to see what your interpretation, how accurate it was, and, and uh, to learn more about the environment so that you could do new interpretations in the future. I started working with aerial photography as my forestry training proceeded and it was something that I was also pretty good at. I could see spatial patterns and I could understand how those patterns might look on the ground and I could relate those and so it was just something that was a bit more of a, a skill that I started to focus on throughout my uh, undergraduate training. It was just a fortunate coincidence that I was able to, uh, to combine my uh, skill with aerial photography with the uh, increasing availability of remote sensing images from satellites and then finally got to the point where I was working with computers to uh, develop algorithms that could actually extract the information that we could see in the images uh, visually but we often had very primitive tools to extract them and so we started thinking about the ways computers could be used to really help support this whole image analysis uh, you know, task. Uh, I, I do know that the technology that we have uh, been privileged to use in the case of remote sensing and in lots of other fields has been enormously powerful. Uh, but it's really human, you know, it's, it's the human factor that's important. It's, it's what we do with that information. It's, you know, how do we get together and make decisions? For me, remote sensing needs to be more transdisciplinary. It means that it can't be remote sensing scientists who are doing the remote sensing and ecologists who are doing the, you know, the ecological application. It actually means that we need to get together as colleagues and collaborators and, and ensure that we have a full vision for what we can accomplish together. Remote sensing has been part of our cultural requirements as a species for a long period of time. Now obviously throughout uh, the period of human migration there would always be people going ahead and trying to determine whether there was a, a good place for everyone to follow. In numbers, I think it mentions, he sent forth the surveyors so they could uh, determine whether the land was good. Artists had been thinking about this for probably hundreds of years. There are tapestries in uh, you know, earlier uh, civilizations in China, for example, where it seems that they were trying to create this image. They were trying to imagine what the Earth did look like. The remote sensing that we do now probably would seem like magic to the people who first imagined what uh, remote sensing might be like. The first recorded use of remote sensing in forestry, for example, occurred in, in 1887 by a German forester who had been experimenting with a camera that he'd taken aloft in a balloon and he was trying to identify different species of trees. Prior to that, uh, even in the uh, you know, Franco-Russian War in, in the 1850s, there was uh, potential, they sent observers aloft in balloons and they would take cameras with them, the rudimentary cameras uh, and recording devices. So there are always military applications right from the very beginning. There's a book that came out recently called Earthrise and it was, it's really the story of the picture of Earth from the moon that was taken by the Apollo astronauts and the impact that that has had and it's almost the single most, it is the single most important environmental image of our time, maybe of all time. And it's, it's a remote sensing image, but it's the remote sensing image of our home, our, you know, the place we live, the only place we have, and the only place we're likely to have for a long time. And uh, I think many people, when they see it, they see the fragility of the, of the environment that we inhabit. The early astronauts often had the cameras trained on the moon as they were getting there. Then they would glance back and then they would change that and so all the cameras were pointed back at Earth. Uh, and they had this struggle actually with the controllers on the ground who were suddenly like, why are you guys, you know, what, we're here to go to the moon, we're not, you know, and they would say, well, you know, these images are really powerful. 
And they were life-altering in some cases, if you go back to some of what the astronauts have said. They will speak very poetically about the impact that this has had on their lives. The image of the Earth seen from the moon, it galvanized, I think, a number of people. It galvanized people interested in the environment because they could see, you know, that's our home and it's the place that we should probably manage very carefully. The Earthrise image is really the most famous remote sensing image of all time. And it created, uh, you know, a little bit more of a stimulus to use this technology in ways that would benefit uh, our environmental stewardship. If remote sensing can help create this sense of connectedness to the, the land, uh, re-establish, if you will, the, the, uh, the bond that we have with the, with the natural world, I think that might be, in fact, its greatest contribution.